one of my the Bible verses, and I. Um, so, in, in full disclosure, um, this is the last meeting I'm going to have with you guys for a while because next week is Father's Day, and we will not have a meeting. And graduation ceremony, which I guess even if it wasn't Father's Day, we probably still wouldn't have one. And a church anniversary. Is it church anniversary? Wow, nine years. Okay, that's a big deal. Um, and then after that, I'll, I'll be out of the country for a couple of weeks. So um, I didn't really want to start anything I couldn't finish. So one of my favorite things to do is just go to a Bible verse that I really, really love and just kind of dig into it a little bit. Um, because I enjoy it because I already love the verse, so the prep is very easy for me because um, it's something I've already thought about like a thousand times, and I could just put some papers, some words on a page, and, and it's kind of easy for me as well. Um, so if, you, um, if you're curious what verse it is, it's John 10.10, 10. Um, and I feel like John 10.10 10 is such a good verse because it like debunks one of the biggest myths Right. And, I, and I'll read the verse for you. And it says the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. And I feel like if you look at just that verse, it is like like if you were going to have like a banner verse for like Christianity, I th like that that could sum it up. Now, obviously, there's more there's more to it. But just that one verse sums it up because we live our lives like buying into a lie, right? That it's about what you have, it's about acquiring more, it's about happiness being around the corner, it's about, you know, self-fulfillment and like, you know, just indulgence and, and pleasure and all of these things. But if you look at this verse, all that messaging that we receive all the time, who's it from? It's from the thief. And if you look around, you get a lot of people who are like buying into it and they believe this thief but we see that when people go down these roads, where does it always take them, right? To destruction. But Christ is basically saying that, like, I came to give you life and to give it more abundantly. And I feel that if we were honest with ourselves, we start talking about our spiritual lives and the things that Christ has written in this book, inspired by the Holy Spirit through all 66 books of the Bible, if we were honest with ourselves, a lot of the times, it doesn't feel like he's offering us more. It feels like he's offering us less because it says don't do this don't do that thank you Claudia did you fix that right now that's impressive okay because we look at the bible and we always look at the bible saying don't do this don't do that don't do this don't do that so when we start thinking about getting like you know really spiritual or closer to the church or you know like closer to god and all of these things we start thinking about this as like you know less but God, Christ is telling us, this is, no, 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 I'm coming to offer more, right? Not only more, but abundance. Because Christ doesn't just want us to live. And I feel like a lot of the times we get that confused. Like Christ says, I, I want you to live, but I want you to live abundantly. So the question is, is how are we walking in that? Do you feel like your, your life right now has abundance in it? Because if that is what Christ is offering us, we're showing up here on Sunday right? We even came upstairs to the meeting, but you are not seeing abundance in your life, then, then there's a disconnect, right? And, and if, if I was honest with myself, then I say, not only is there a disconnect and I don't feel abundance, but there's a part of me that I'm always wanting more of something. And now that of something part is kind of important. Right? Because we're all wanting more of something because we're not feeling filled. And I will tell you that I feel that we are a focused people, right? When it comes to being like goal oriented, and I say this all of the time, right? Like if you look at some of our churches, we have some of the most successful like congregants. I remember when we went to St. Uh, when, uh, when I was growing up at St. John, we decided that we would partner with a local church. Um, it was a Protestant church kind of like, you know, just down the street. And we said it would be great if we can get the churches together. We could do like a medical, like a, um, like a medical service day, right? Like maybe it'd be like the first weekend of the month and we can get people who are like low to moderate income who need medical care. We can bring them together. We can give them free medical care, like in the name of Christ. 
And this was a Protestant church. It had probably about six to 7,000 people in the congregation. You know, they, they were running two services on Saturday. They were four on Sunday. And, and do you, you know what they told us? They said, man, this sounds like a great idea, but we don't, we don't have any doctors in our congregation. And I said, you guys got six to 7,000 like, members and you don't have any doctors? We probably have six to 7,000 doctors, right? Like they might not all come, but <laughs> like we got But the reality of it is, is when it comes to like, you know, we are very focused people. And when we want to achieve something, we either set our minds to it and we achieve it, right? And we're so focused that sometimes we lose a blessing along the way. You know, so for, for me, yesterday, I spent the day at Disneyland, okay? with all four of my Rugrats and my beautiful wife. And um, it was a very frustrating process, right? Because first of all, um, with four kids, you don't do the fast pass, okay? It's $20 a ticket, right? So after spending like, admission for a family of six is like $1,500. So after you spend like $1,500 to get in, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna get $120 out of me for a fast pass, right? So we're sitting there and now I get 60 minutes of quality time with my kids every single like, line that we go into. And the thing that was frustrating about my kid is we're sitting there and I'm trying to enjoy family time with my kids. I'm trying to open, ask them open-ended questions. I'm trying to figure out what, you know, what they like, what they don't like, try to have meaningful conversation. And all my kids are like, we're in the line for one line. Uh, we're in the line for one ride. And, the, and they're saying, hey, what's the wait time for the next ride? What are we doing right after this? What is this? What is that? And, and I, I said, can we just slow down and just enjoy where we're at right now? Right. And one of the things I realized, especially it seemed so crystal clear for me at this time of Disneyland was the fact that so many times we were so focused on what's next. Right. We're not even enjoying what we're actually in right now. And I think that there's a lot of parallels to that. Right. Because we set so many goals that we're focused on the goal and we don't end up even enjoying it. You know, Matthew six tells us something. You know, and it's going to take a second for us to wrap our mind around it, right? But it says that we're not even to be concerned with basic needs, food, shelter, clothing, but we should be concerned with seeking God. And if we are concerned with seeking God, he will, he will take care of everything else, right? And I think that, you know, spirit, the spiritual fullness that God wants to give us, right, that he's offering to give us that, that John 10, 10 abundance, that we're not walking in it. And I think we have to choose the things that he wants us to choose for us to walk in that. Isaiah 55, 2 and 3, right? It says, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen to me carefully and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. You know, and I think what Isaiah is basically saying there is he says, you are putting your trust in things that are worldly. And I think it is a very, very applicable message for the days that we're living in right now. We are putting our trust in things that are worldly and they really offer nothing. And if you look at some of the most people, like some of the people that have achieved the most when it comes to like this worldly definition when you look into them, and I'm not saying in all cases, but I will say if you look at society and what we see in what society is telling us, they might have full pockets but empty hearts, empty souls, and they're not happy. And I say one of the biggest examples of why we should not live worldly lives is when you look at the people who have made it successfully in the worldly manner, right? You see suicide rates. You see overdose rates. Like I would always say it blows my mind that you have something that – you have a person that has everything that the world can offer, and they use drugs. Drugs are an escape. If, if you, you have, have everything, what are you escaping from? Right? And we have to, it's, it's blatantly in this, like, right in front of us. Like, we cannot trust in the worldly things. And if that's the case, then where do we put our trust? We need to live a life that's fully focused on Christ and his principles and everything that he's taught us right? We need to invest in him. We need to listen to him, follow his instructions. And when we do that, I promise you that that path, that path, not only does it lead to abundance, but you find abundance along the way. And I believe that God wants us to be just open wide for him to fill us. Probably, you know, Psalm 81.10, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. 
And I fear that a lot of us have open mouths, but it's not towards God at all. We're willing to consume almost anything, but it's not open for him. It's open to other aspects of our life. Psalm 1611, it says, show me your, uh, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And I love that because so many of us, we're looking for fullness of joy. We're looking to be satisfied. We're looking for that. But it's in his presence it's found. It's at his right hand. That's where we will find pleasures. So I want to give you guys four keys to receive the abundant life with fullness. And the reason I tell you there's four is so you can track my talk, okay? If you're bored, you know there's only four. And as I count through them, you'll see that we're getting close to the finish line, okay? Um, So the first one, and and this this is one that I feel like I speak about all of the time. It says, we need to have a heart that is thirsty to seek God. Thirsty. One of the, I, I feel like I quote this verse all the time, Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, for they shall be filled, right? I talk about that one all of the time because it's a promise. And if you're, if you are, you know, if you're hungry and you're thirsty for him, he will never disappoint. It's a promise. A lot of the times we are hungry, we are thirsty. It is not for him. It is not for what he offers. It is not for anything that he he even cares about. But we are hungering and thirsting for other things completely. One of the best quotes I ever heard was, if you are not hunger, if you're not hungry and thirsty for him, it's because you're full of yourself. And I think that that's a very, very convicting um, statement. Psalm 143, 6, it says, spread out my hands to you. My soul, my soul longs for you like a thirsty land. And I think if we all took a second and really took an inventory, if we were really honest with ourselves, not with the person next to you because we can fool the person next to you all day, right? But if you were honest with yourself, how much do you actually desire God? Right? Like, I think that we can all say that we, we love him, we appreciate him, we believe in him, right? We love when we experience him, we love it when he blesses us, when we see him do something for us in our life. But the question is, is do you really desire him? not the fruit of him. Because a lot of the times we desire, you know, the benefits of having him in our life. But the question is, is, do you really desire him? Because we need to grow that. Because in desiring him, all of the other stuff comes along. Now, my question for you is, if you are not hungering and thirsting for him, what are you chasing? Every single one of us chase after something. There's a hunger and a thirst inside us, every single one of us, for something. But the question is, if it's not Christ and his goodness, what is it? Okay. The second thing, be committed to God's plan for you. And honestly, when I was thinking about this, when I say that this one, this one's a challenge, right? To be committed for God's plan for me, because I, I will tell you, I am 100% committed. I'm 100% committed for a plan, I'm just not convinced it's his. And I think if we were honest, every single one of us is committed to a plan, like my own plan for myself, my own plan for my success, my own plan for where I want my life to go. But that's not what we need to be committed to. He's the one that knows all. He's the one, and guys, if you just wrap your mind around this, like it floors me, that every single one of us was created with specific gifts and talents right? When he made Rudy, he put stuff inside of Rudy that was so specific for his calling for Rudy, right? And we all have that. And the problem is, is it's a sad day if you were created for something so specific with these gifts and talents for such a specific purpose, and you go your whole life and you never figure it out. Like you were made for that. In 2 Timothy 1.9, it says, God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose, his purpose, not our purpose. He's called us according to his purpose with grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And I will tell you guys that when you figure out what God's calling is for you, when you figure out the gifts and the talents as he's put inside of you and you can align those things together, there's a level of satisfaction of purpose of everything that you've never experienced before. 
Like there's one thing to be really good at your job. And there's a lot of people who like Lil Asaf, I almost feel like they're addicted to their jobs because they've figured out a way to take their, get their talents and their purposes to monetize them, right? But because of the fact that they figured out what they're good at, they figured out their gifts and their talents and they're using it at work, they find so much fulfillment in that. Now imagine if you can do that for the purpose that God put it in you. God didn't give you those things so we can go make a ton of money. He gave us those things so we could be fruitful to him in a way that has been ordained since the beginning of time. That's fulfillment. That's better than anything else, right? And God has a plan for you, but the crazy thing about God is God needs us to commit to his plan because he's not gonna force us. He's gonna give us all the free will that we want, but he needs us to commit it. But the more we align and commit ourselves to his plan and his purpose, I promise you the more that you will feel fulfilled because it's what we were literally made to do. And that's where we find his abundance, right? right you you talk, talk about where do we find his abundance? We find his abundance on his path. A lot of us, we're walking these paths and there's no abundance. It's because we were never meant to be on that road, right? Not the path of our own self-will, not our own decisions, not the things that we are chasing. But if you want abundance on the path, then if we are on his path, we will find it along the way. Third thing, do you guys remember the first one? Thirst, yes. A heart that's thirst, thirsty to seek God. The second one, committed to God's plan for us. Not our own plan, but God's plan. The third one, really love the time that we spend with God and in his word. Guys, this progresses, right? Because there's a lot of the times that that's, that's a tough one, isn't it? To really enjoy the time that we spend with God and his word. Like, if we were honest with ourselves, when we just sit in the, te- in the presence of God, sometimes it's really uncomfortable. Sometimes we get really bored. Sometimes our mind really wanders. Uh, wanders. Sometimes we get like to-do lists kind of in our mind of all of this other stuff that we kind of have to do. But we have to train ourselves. And the more time we spend with God and his word, we really get to know him. We, we really get to know his character. When we're reading through the Bible, and guys, this Bible is not just a book. This is literally the living word of God. And when we read it, it activates the Holy Spirit inside of us to kind of stir us up. And I encourage you that when you read the Bible, it doesn't make sense or any of this stuff, get a good commentary because this Bible should change your life. And I will tell you, like, you know, our minds and our thoughts, you know, this is the way I kind of look at, like, time alone in the presence of God is we're all at a different place in that, Okay. For some of us, unfortunately, right, but it's, it's our reality, is some of us, we're, we're just courting with God right now. We're kind of, he knows us, but we're just starting to kind of date him and figuring out what he's kind of like. For others, we might even be engaged, right? Like we've made a commitment, right, that we're moving in the right direction and we're getting to know each other more to see if the situation's really, really going to get serious, right? Others of us, I will tell you, like, our, our relationship with Christ is much more of a covenant relationship like marriage, where we say, like, I am all in. I am committed. Good times, bad times, right? Those other two stages might not have been that way, right? But you're married to guys. I'm, I'm in it. Good, bad, I'm going to be faithful, right? And the thing that kind of broke my heart was I was thinking about this is some of us, you know, we might be separated from God, like we, we, we were good, we were committed, we were in a covenant relationship, maybe something happened or, or maybe there was a little bit of a distance and we pulled back, right? And that's where we could be living, unfortunately. But we need to, to realize that the only place that we will find that abu- the abundance, the fullness, the joy is in that relationship with him. And we have to push through. We have to push through. I love Psalm um, 1, 1 through 3 where it says, Blessed is a man who delights in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall also not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. And guys, that is what abundance looks like. You know, and what I love it because when in, in the psalm it talks about the tree and being planted next to the waters, and you imagine the the roots running deep. Right, And that root, those roots running deep is exactly what prevents that tree from falling over. 
And I feel like a lot of us, we, we, we might be at the beginning stages there, right? Like we're, we're enjoying it, but the roots aren't deep yet. But the more time we spend in the presence of God next to that stream, next to that river, right? With all of the living water coming through, that's how we become deep. That's how we become rooted. That's how we become unshakable. And that's what a lot of us are just needing, right? We need to spend more time in the presence of God because not only does it change us, but it always changes towards the better. And the fourth and the last one, last one, so the first one was thirst. Second one was committed. Third one was spend time. Fourth one is be generous in every aspect of your life. That is a biblical principle. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes there are things in this world where you know that it's in the Bible, but it, it basically makes absolutely no sense. But that's in those areas. That's exactly where God shows up. God shows up when he asks us to do things that basically make absolutely no sense. And, and I love this when it comes to the being generous. And if you've got kids, one of the most recited Bible verses probably at your house is Acts 20, 35. It is more blessed to give than to receive, right? Do we say that to our kids all the time? I'll tell you, we say that to our kids all the time. Right. Like I tell that, especially with four boys that are always fighting with each other. Right. And everyone's worried about how oh, and like I need this and like his piece was bigger than my piece and like, you know, all of this other stuff. Right. You always tell them, say, hey, man, like it's more blessed to give than to receive. Right. And I will tell you that it's easy to say to our kids. It is hard to say it to ourselves if we were honest, because a lot of times it is. It's really, really hard to give. But I will tell you. The only way that you consider yourself, you can ever consider yourself to be in a position to give in abundance, right, is if you've received an abundance, right? Like if you operate from a stance of abundance, is it a big deal to give things away? If you operate from a stance of this might not be enough, is it going to be hard to give things away? 100%. So a lot of the times we look at these little biblical practices where it says more blessed to give than to receive. You say, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? What it means is it takes faith, right? It doesn't say faith in that verse, but that verse is a, is a verse that has faith written all over it, right? We need to be generous, right? We can't be stingy. And I'm going to be honest with you. When we start talking about this stuff, everyone thinks that you're talking about money, right? Yeah, we're building a church. We're doing all that other stuff. We've got capital needs, but I'm going to tell you one of the things, one of my favorite stories was somebody said, oh yeah, God just wants my money, right? And he said, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's the very beginning. God wants it all. He doesn't just want your money. He will not just be satisfied with your money. He wants it all, right? What does he want? He wants to be serving. He wants your gifts. He wants your talents. He wants your time. He wants your hospitality. He wants your love. He wants your finances. He wants everything, and then how we treat those things is very clear on whether or not we have faith that everything he told us in this book is true. 2 Corinthians 6, 9 through eight, uh, 9, 6 through 8, it says, But I say this, that whoever sparing, uh, sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one, as he gives purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves his cheerful giver. And if God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all good things, may have abundance in every good work. And what God's basically saying is like, hey, I'm going to match you. I'm going to match your energy, right? If you're generous, I'm going to be generous, right? If you're stingy, I'm going to be stingy. I'm going to match your energy. I remember, so one of my clients at the bank was a very, 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 very successful author, okay? He wrote this book about, you know, purpose, like, you know, maybe a purpose-driven life, right? So one of the things that he was really big about was this aspect of reverse tithing, right? Where he would keep 10% of his income and he would give away 90. And I remember I was reading that and I was just like, dude, that is really crazy. So I was talking to him one day and I said, did, how did that happen? And then he says, you know what, Peter? I was faithful in my tithe when I had nothing. And then the more God gave me, I just gave away more. It, was, it wasn't how much do I get to keep? It was more of how much do I need to keep? And then, and he was like, as God kept blessing me and I was what he felt like, you know, he said, and I just felt that I was just, 
living off of like what I could modestly like, you know, kind of get by on. And he's like, that's when I started realizing that God started giving more and more and more and more. Because at that point, this guy was just a funnel, right? And he would take that all, whatever was excess, and he would just use it in different ministries and give it back to God and things that he wanted to like further his purpose, right? But it was one of those things where he says, I, I truly believe that God not, would not have given me the resources that I had if I would have been cheap with them in the beginning, right? But when I was faithful in the small things, he trusted me with much bigger things. And I think if you really needed to think about that, should blow your mind a little bit, right? That God is going to match our energy when it comes to how generous we are with others and with our, ourselves and our talents and our time. Some of the most fruitful people that I know when it comes to the service are the ones that are the most generous with their times. They give so much time right? It, it reminds me of when St. Paul's talking about being a bond servant, right? Like they don't hold anything back, but they are the same people that just seem to have it all under control. And they, their lives doesn't seem to have a shortage of time, which is beautiful. Um, and then we also know, especially when it comes to this aspect, and this is a verse that everyone quotes all the time, but I just feel like I can't give a talk without including it, is Malachi 3.10, where it says, bring all the tithes into my storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, I will not open for you the windows, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there might not be enough room to receive it. And I want to tell you guys something. Take the money out of that. Okay, because I know that everyone likes to talk about that verse and they like to talk about it when it comes to money and tithe and God, like, you know, it's almost like a Ponzi scheme, right? Like if you give God a dollar, he's going to give you back a dollar fifty, and that's, that's not what it is at all. But what I want you to do is I want you to think about the fact that God is basically saying that if you give time, gifts, talents, relationships, whatever, if you give, I will not disappoint. I will not. Be generous. Be generous in every aspect of your life. And I think that that is the true calling on whether or not we can see whether or not we're faithful. How you treat the same things that you have limited resources of. So the first one was, be thirsty. The second one was be committed to God's plan for you. The third one was love to spend time with God and in his word. And the fourth one was be generous in all aspects of your life. So here's my prayer. Four things for you to focus on this week. Four things. Okay. And I hope that God will come alongside of you this week and he will encourage you in these things. I, I hope that he will encourage you in these things. I hope there's going to be aspects of your life this week where you say, this is what abundant life feels like, right? So again, just in closing, thirsty for God, committed to God's plan, fall in love with spending time with God and in his word, and the fourth one, be generous. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you because you are such a good God, Lord. You are a God that has only the best things planned for us, Lord. You have such, you, you desire abundance for us, Lord. Because truly you are our Heavenly Father, Lord. And we know that you freely offer us the, frich, uh, the riches of Christ. But Lord, I feel like so many times I'm, I'm the son who, who's run out, Lord. I'm the son who's not living in his Father's riches, so, Lord, I ask that you just allow me to set my eyes on you, Lord, and to draw from you, Lord. Lord, I ask that you allow me just to thirst for you, Lord, where, you know, we chase after all of these other things that never satisfy, Lord. They are nothing but a, just, just a vapor. So, Lord, teach us how, Lord, just to, to desire you, Lord, and to actually almost just be addicted to you, that we search for you in everywhere that we go, Lord. Lord, I ask that you just open every single one of our eyes to your plan for us, Lord, for so many, so many times, Lord, that just, it seems so weird and we don't even know where to start, that you have a path for us, Lord. But I ask that just for every single one of us, Lord, that you just teach us to put one step in front of the other, Lord, on that path. I ask that you guide us all individually, that this is not just something that's strange for us, Lord, or too abstract for us. For Lord, I know that you have a plan for us, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you just be glorified in everything that you do, Lord. I ask that you be a big God to us, Lord. I ask that you teach us how, Lord, just to follow you, to be committed to you, Lord, to be generous for you, Lord. Because, Lord, these are the things that I know that will 
that will please you, Lord, but will also give us an abundant life. And I ask that we experience this alongside of your goodness and your love and your grace and your mercy in everything that we do. I ask that you hear these prayers lifted in the session of all your saints from our chairs. Here's what we pray, thankfully. Our Father, who art in We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but to the Christ Jesus, our Lord, for the kingdom and the power. All right, guys. So next week, we got the graduation thing. Hey, I'm going to encourage you guys all. If you guys don't see somebody that usually shows up today, call them. Check up on them, right? That church was very, very empty downstairs. And I know that when I skip, uh, I skip a Sunday, it feels really good when somebody asks about me. So I appreciate that.